There we go. So now we are recording. Okay, very good. I'll get back to the presentation. Whoops, sorry about that. I'm a little bit new at this as well. So bear with me, we are getting there. Um, all right. So are we back on? Everybody okay? We didn't lose anybody? Okay, so coming back to the chart of accounts is that in every business, we have what we call direct expenses and indirect expenses. So if you wanna understand how to price your product or service, we need the chart of accounts to be properly set up so that we can keep track of our direct expenses. And what I mean by direct expenses is mean that we had to incur that expense in order to make the revenue. And the indirect expenses, the way to properly explain it is that it doesn't matter if somebody comes through the door or not, or buys a product from you or not, we will still incur those expenses, like the telephone and the taxes and the insurance and you know office supplies and those type of things. So they're not directly related to the sale. But again, when we look at businesses is that in all businesses, the two biggest costs in any business is gonna be labor and cost of materials. So it depends on what type of sector that you're in. If you're in retail, it's gonna be mostly products that you're selling very little labor. If you're in manufacturing, it's going to be about one third labor, one third products, because you're transpo transposing those that material into something. If you're looking at the service sector, it's going to be mostly labor. So if you're in insurance or consulting or whatever that may be. Um, so it, it varies, but the two biggest costs in any business is always going to be labor and materials. This is why we need to have the chart of accounts properly set up so that we can really understand how we price our product and service. We're going to be looking at that a little later on. Oops, is there another? I'm an artist and I draw and paint. Well, the same thing happens there. When you look at the time that you're putting in, in order to um, prepare the because that's you actually what you're selling. You're selling your your artwork, but you also have to. If you're selling it, if you're if you're an artist and you're making a living at this, then whatever you're selling your artwork for, it needs to be able to provide you with the material to, in order to produce the artwork, but also the time that it's spent to produce it, as well as the indirect expenses that you needed to keep your business operating. So it it is a little bit the same thing, but the chart of accounts again, we need to. But because even as an artist or even as an owner in a business is that we, we, we're not going to spend 100% of our time actually um, providing a service to a client. So sometimes we're working on the business. So we're doing the accounting and we're doing, you know, making calls and we're researching stuff or whatever that may be, putting quotes together. So that is what we call administrative work. And then when we talk about doing actually work for a client, so this is where even in your accounting system, let's say that 50% of your time is producing stuff and the other 50% of the time is actually managing and operating the business, we need to separate those out. But in 98% of the cases, when I look at financial statements, all I see is one line for wages and benefits, which is the wrong thing. And this is what, you know, the accounting software people have an opportunity here to help a lot of businesses and we're way behind on that that's why i say we're teaching the wrong stuff in universities when i look at entrepreneurs i you know every entrepreneur that i work with i'll ask them what is your financial goal in that in that sense i mean okay what is your net profit and net profits is basically revenues minus all expenses after we've paid ourselves a fair market wage what is your net profit goal for next year as a percentage of revenue? And in 98% of the cases, entrepreneurs do not have any. So I'll ask you very quickly, you can just say in the chat line, it's either a yes or no. Do you have a net profit goal for next year? And then what I find is that the entrepreneurs have a really difficult time pricing their product or service to actually be profitable. And I'll allude to that in a minute because You'll see why I say that. Now, the other thing is that we need to start thinking in percentages and not necessarily thinking of just looking at the numbers. The numbers will go up and down. Revenues and expenses, they go up and down all the time. And so what we need to do is convert all of those revenues and expenses 
into percentages because we want to compare apples and apples. That's sort of the constant. But what's happening again in, again is in 90, 98% of the software accounting softwares that I see out there, Sage is one of them, QuickBooks is another one. Um, there's quite a few of them out there. They do not provide you the percentages that you need in order to make informed decisions and to help you price your product and service properly. So having said that, is that the reason I say that we're teaching the wrong stuff is that in the 35 years or so that I've been keeping track of this stuff, if I, this is Canada, Canadian statistics, but they're the same on an international basis because I used to do a lot of work on the international um, sort of segment when I was at uh, Acadia University because we delivered an international program on small business certification. And so it was recognized by uh, quite a few countries, when I say quite a few, over 100 countries that we were delivering this program into. But what I do realize in Canada, if I just look at Canada alone and I look at the last 35 years, which these statistics have not changed, 50% of every company that started up will not make it to the fifth year. Now, that's a problem. And the only reason they don't make it to the fifth year is simply this is that they're not making enough money. They're not making enough profit. They can't pay themselves. They can't put food on the table and they can't reinvest in their business. So 50% of companies fail to make it to the fifth year. In Canada, we have about 2.4 million businesses that are registered and there's about 1.1 million that actually have paid employees. So when we look at those 1.1 million businesses, 54% of all businesses in Canada have less than four employees. 75% have less than 10, 87% have less than 20, and 95% have less than 50, and 98% have less than 100. And when you look at who makes up policies for small business for Canada on the, on the, on the, and on the uh, sort of the, um, the, the, the national government level, is that it's going to be Industry Canada. And when you look at Industry Canada, their definition of a small business is businesses with less than 500 employees. Well, we're missing the boat right there. If you're making policies for large corporation, what's happening to the small businesses? In Canada, we have 80 to 85 to 90,000 businesses that open up their doors every year and 85 to 90 that close their doors every year. The number of businesses have not really increased that much in the last 35 years, as far as a percentage of population. However, was there, was there a chat? Was there a question in the chat? Randy, hey, good, thank you, Randy. <laughs> the net profit, okay. So now all of those companies that surpass five years 80% of all those companies make less than, I, I was generous here in putting 2%, but I know it's around 1%, but I'm trying to be optimistic here. 80% of all companies that surpass five years earn a modest profit of less than 2%. That's a net profit after the owner has taken a fair market salary um, from their business. Because you can either pay yourself through dividends or you can pay yourself through a salary. If you're paying yourself through dividends, I will add that back in as far as a, as an expense, especially if you are working in the business and that is your, 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 your earnings that you need in order to live. Now, over and above that, that would be some profits, but that's okay. So the one thing though I do wanna mention here is that this is why I'm saying that we're teaching the wrong stuff in universities. If we're getting these same results year after year for the last 35 years, not just on a national basis, but on an international basis, we're teaching the wrong stuff because universities, people go to university and then they transfer, I mean, they come from all countries to go to university, then they go back to their own country. So we're teaching the same things. And then I can actually prove it to you because I was down in Estevan, we had about 65 people in a room. Eight, we had eight of them that were accountants. So the first thing I ask is, I ask the entrepreneurs, just as a simple question is that, who decides depreciation in your business? And they all pointed at the accountant. I said, why are they deciding depreciation in the business? Well, they said, well, we just don't know how it works. Well, it's not that complicated. We're actually going to look at that. But that is a major issue simply because when you look at a balance sheet, the balance sheet is basically made up of three things. We're going to get to that in a second. You got assets, which is what you own, liabilities, which is what you owe. And if you took all your assets minus all the things you owe, what's left is your equity. It's no more complicated than that. But when you're depreciating things quicker than you need to, 
um, you know, that when I, you know, I did turn up to the accounts and I said, who made you God by deciding their depreciation? Well, they said, we don't decide, they say CRA decides. So I brought up the CRA website and I said, where does it tell you what the depreciation should be? Well, they said right there, it tells, you know, for vehicles it's 30%, for equipment it's 20%, for buildings it's 4%, for asphalt it's 8%. I said, yeah, but read it. I said, this is the maximum allowed, not the minimum allowed. So if you're, you know, as an example, if you're financing a vehicle and you just got a deal for 84 months at 0% interest and you're financing it and your accountant is depreciating that vehicle at 30% because CRA allows it. Well, in three years time, you've depreciated your asset by 90%. You still owe four years on it. You're technically bankrupt. You owe more money than what you own. This is why people don't want to lend you any money. So from a cash flow perspective, we have to keep in mind how we're financing, financing things and how we're depreciating. We'll come back to that. So you probably recognize by now that I'm not passionate about this subject. But anyway, I'm really, I'm, I'm, you know, one of the things that I'll ask is that, okay, last year at your year end, for those who have businesses that have been operating in business and you're working, let's say, with, with accountants, how much time did you spend with the accountant to review the financial statements and to look on how we're going to improve the profit of our business, strategies to improve the profit? And in 98% of the cases, people say, we've never had that discussion. And when you ask the accounts, they say, well, we're just here to fulfill the requirements of CRA. Well, if you're there to fulfill the requirements of CRA, let CRA pay the bill. If you're there working for the client, then work for the client in order to get them to make more money. So there's a disconnect there, and it's a cultural change that we need to change. This is one of the reasons why I resigned from the university just to help small businesses across Canada to understand this. We need accountants, don't get me wrong, but you have to have good conversations with them and you have to ask the right questions so that we can make more money. And listen, the more taxes you pay, that it's, it's a good thing because that means the more money you made. And listen, in Canada, up to $500,000 net profit, companies are only gonna pay around 13% corporate tax. So why are you going to jeopardize the, 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 the profitability of your business by try, try, trying to save a few tax dollars? So again, it's really about, um, it's not about paying, you know, you just give your fair share to government, don't give all you have to, but you also have to retain some for you and you need money to reinvest in the business. So now best in sector companies achieve 10% or more net profits all the time, even in a pandemics like today. I can go to, I can bring you to a lot of different companies and they're still achieving that simply because they react to the situation. What we're seeing, you know, in all the research I've done about around the pandemic is that I look at customer behavior and I'm looking at where are they comfortable in purchasing their products and services. Again, in probably 98% of the cases and the research that I've done is customers, their health is is, is, is number one. So they want to protect their health of themselves, their loved ones and family members. So that is really important to them is their health. So we need to protect them. As owners of businesses, we need to make sure that we're doing everything in order to protect our customers because that's number one. The second thing is safety. So if you have businesses that are not adhering to protect their customers or their employees, um, this is where people are getting skeptical and not frequenting that, that business anymore. And we've had this here, right here in, 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 well, across Canada, actually. But a typical example of that would be restaurants. And, you know, the restaurants that we go to, the waiters or waitresses have, have a mask and they have a shield in front. So it's double protected. And they're making sure that you come in with a mask. The only time you take off your mask is when you're eating or if, you, and then you have to put back your mask if you have to go to the washroom or when you go to pay and they come in one door and they go out another door, they're doing everything they can to protect the customers and their, their, their staff. And those businesses are flourishing. Those that are a little bit loosey goosey on the rules and regulations. Well, people, if, if a person is very conscientious or vulnerable, um, they will probably not continue to go to that place, even if they've gone the first time, but if they feel uncomfortable, they will not go back. So anyway, just, uh, just some observations that I've seen um, over, the, um, over the last number of months that we've been working with businesses with COVID. So, on, so coming back to, you know, why do we, 
uh, how, you know, why is cash flow important? Well, first of all, we sort of have to understand a little bit the balance sheet because cash flow is all about working capital. What I mean by working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. What current assets is, is basically cash or anything that can be converted into cash in the next 12 months. Current liabilities is everything we owe in the next 12 months. When you get into a cash flow problem, it means that you have too much obligations and not enough money in order to pay those obligations. So we got to fix that, but it's got to be properly structured in your balance sheet so you can look at that information, especially on a monthly basis and make informed decisions. But what I'm finding is that that's not even properly structured in 98% of the cases with businesses. So just keep that in mind. Everything going good for everybody? Thumbs up. I can't see you, but I'm sure everything's good. I'm not hearing anything. All right, we keep going. So, how to improve cash flows? Oh, is there was there a question? No questions. All right, you're good. All right, like I'll tell my student, clear as mud. Okay, so let's look at the balance sheet. So, and then we'll look at the income statement a little bit later on, but the balance sheet is, as I said, there's assets, liabilities, and equity. One important thing is that we have to separate it out into three categories. We have assets, we have current assets and fixed assets. And sometimes I see financial statements and all I have is assets. There's no deviation between current assets and fixed assets. Under liabilities, there's no deviation between current liabilities and long-term liabilities. So if I go back just a slide here, is that a balance sheet is simply a snapshot picture of your financial situation at a specific date in time. How much the money do I have? How much assets do I have? And what are they valued on the balance sheet? But we'll talk about that in a minute. And then secondly is how much money do I owe today? And then if I took all my assets and I converted everything into cash and I sort of sold everything, converted everything into cash, my inventory, my vehicles, my all my, my fixed asset as well, and I paid everybody I owed money to, what I would have left is equity. So we just simply have to understand that the balance sheet is just a snapshot picture. It doesn't tell you much about operations and if you're profitable or not at this point. It just tells you what the financial picture is. So coming back is that we have assets, liabilities, and equity. The equity Basically, there's three categories there. We'll, we'll talk about it briefly, but it's um, when you actually incorporated the company, um, you put, you either had common shares or preferred shares or whatever that may be, but anyway, it's the shares of the company. Then we have retained earnings, which is profits and losses from previous years carried forward. And current earnings is where you're, you're at year to date. How much money are you making in your business? Now, this is, more, this is more important, I would say, for incorporated companies. For sole proprietors, the, un, the unfortunate thing about sole, sole proprietors is that you and the business are one and the same. Whatever assets that you own personally and the business owns are together, and whatever you owe personally and whatever you own from the business side is still all liabilities. So you're not going to necessarily have a balance sheet, but it would be ideal for you to have a balance sheet, even as a sole proprietorship, to understand it and making sure that your business is operating efficiently, especially from a cash flow perspective. So let's go back to, let's go to current assets. So I said before, it's anything that can and will be converted into cash in the next 12 months. So if you're looking at your financial statements, the current assets is anything that can and will be converted into cash in the next 12 months. So what we have here is basically your current account, petty cash, accounts receivable, if you sell on credit, inventory, you know, and I put livestock here for resale is also um, an inventory, but if it's livestock for breeding, it's not necessarily inventory. Uh, inventory. Um, that would be a fixed asset if it's for breeding stock. Prepaid expenses, for example, insurance. Now this is one thing Again, coming back from a cash flow perspective, how many of you actually have financial statements on a monthly basis so that you can look and see what you did the month before? Or do you wait till the end of the year, bring everything to the accountant, then they'll take three months in order to put together, and then they'll give you your financial statements, and it still doesn't make any sense to you. So how many of you have actual financial statements you can look at on a month-to-month -month basis? Yeah. 
Nicole? We can't hear you, Nicole. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so do you have financial statements on a monthly basis? No, I'm sorry. I've never been on Zoom before. <laughs> I was trying to send in chat, but. Oh, okay. <laughs> but you're you're but, hearing everything, okay? I uh, yeah. No, um, I just like kind of started because I was working, but then I lost my job because of COVID and stuff. And I always just, I just love art. Okay. And I've been told a lot of times that it's um, hard to make money and kind of like an irrational career, but I don't really care because my husband, um, he works from home and he also runs a roofing company. So. And listen, um, you, you got to do what you're passionate about. Life is too short. So this yeah, is so that's what I'm doing. So I, I'm just starting, but I just, um, that's why I'm joining these groups. I don't really know like how to go about doing all that stuff. But okay. All right. Well, that's good. I post a lot of my stuff online, like on my Facebook and stuff, and people buy stuff, but it's only like to my friends that I have on there. <laughs> and I'm trying to build my Instagram. But other than that, I'm not really sure. Well, again, you know, if you're you, depending on your artwork, you can you can always go to you know art. Um, there are places where you can sell your art so you know so it, it, it might well, be I used to do trade shows but they don't have those now no but i'm thinking of specialty art stores you know like so they, they have sort of galleries and stuff like that so if you can get yourself into some of these um then other people are selling your product you'll have to sell it to them a little cheaper so that they mm -hmm. can make a margin but at the same time there's an opportunity there in order to get your product out but we'll we'll come back to that uh, as far as pricing so one of the things that i'm i am mentioning as far as coming back to financial statements is that we need to know if we're making money on a regular basis we cannot wait till the 11th month of the year and say oh i should have done something earlier so when i look at prepaid expenses let me give you an example so let's say that you have 12 you're paying for insurance and let's say it's twelve hundred dollars a year for whatever insurance it is well if you get your insurance bill in january and you pay twelve hundred dollars in january and you expense it in january although it's for the whole year but you expense it in january when you look at your income statement for january it's going to be out of whack because you're going to say well i've I didn't make any money in January because I got a $1,200 expense here, but I do know it's for the next 12 months. What we encourage people to do is simply what we call put it in prepaid expenses. So what would happen is let's say January 1st, you get your insurance bill, you put it in your um, balance sheet as prepaid expenses, $1,200. On January 31st, what you'll do is you'll go take one twelfth of that, which is $100, You'll take it out of prepaid expenses, which will bring it down from twelve hundred to eleven hundred, and you'll apply a hundred dollars for insurance for the month of January. So then, when you look at your income statement, revenues and expenses, it's more real than what it is as far as if you just put everything. And the reason we put it in prepaid expenses is simply this: is that if for some reason you would close your business and you would cancel your insurance, whatever because insurance is one of those things that you pay up front for the next year. If you're paying on a yearly basis, some people pay monthly, but if you're paying for a whole year, if you do close your business, whatever portion hasn't been used, you're going to get a credit back. So that's why it's part of a current asset. And this is why I, I so I emphasize that to people, the same thing you will do for like property taxes, property taxes are for a year long operation. It's not just for, you know, um, for the month of July or August or whenever you pay your taxes. So you do the same thing with property taxes. Anything that you pay for a whole year and you get one bill, you should, what we call, amortize it over the 12 month period. From a cash flow perspective, it becomes very important because a little later on, I'm going to show you what are the things that we need to keep an eye on on the balance sheet to make sure that we're in a positive cash flow. But if you've paid all of that out and it's for the next 12 months, it will deplete your current assets and then it'll put you in trouble. The other thing is if you're making money, you want to have investments. We'll talk about that a little later. And then a capital account. I've only seen one business, unfortunately, out of the 900 that I've worked with that actually have a capital account. 
And so I encourage that for all businesses to set up a capital account in your, especially if you have assets and you're depreciating assets. So whether it's vehicles, whether it's buildings, whether it's um, equipment, whatever that may be. And basically how the capital account works is that if, if your expense, so, so depreciation is the same thing. Depreciation doesn't just come once a year at the end of the year. Depreciation is all year long. You buy something today, next month it's worth a little bit less. The next month after that, it's worth a little bit less even there. So let's say, and, I, and I'll explain to you how to calculate depreciation. And you should be able to know that. But once you use depreciation, depreciation is what we call a non-cash outlay expense. We actually didn't take money out of our pocket to pay for it. But what we do do, and again, I'm providing you some sort of tips of what are these successful businesses that are making 10% net profit and more, what are they doing? So when we expense depreciation on a monthly basis, um, and then so the amount of that depreciation, since we didn't actually pay any money out, but we use that as an expense, then go to your current account, physically take that money out and put it into a capital account. Let that build up, then use that money. You may want to put it in T-bills or GICs or something to make a little bit of money. So now you're making money with other with, with, with your money. So you, the sort of companies that are successful are actually doing this. So then when you need to replace the equipment, when you need to repair um, the building or whatever that may be, then that will be, you can use that money, it'll be your money. But since you've already expensed it, and again, it's thinking about cash flow, because if you leave money in your current account and you don't do these type of things, once the money builds up in your current account, account and listen, I've worked with so many entrepreneurs before, is whenever they see money in their current account, they end up going buying something. Well, we're gonna buy another piece of equipment, we got the money in the bank. And then all of a sudden they got bills coming up, well, we can't pay the bills because we just bought, just paid this piece of equipment or we purchased something. So this is why by running your business, understanding you know, um, um, your balance sheet and also taking that money physically for depreciation, putting it into a capital account, then your operating account is really your current account and that's the money you have to operate with. So just so that you, you understand that. So fixed asset, like again, when we talk about current assets and anything that can and will be converted into cash in the next 12 months, listen, fixed asset is anything that we're not going to convert into cash in the next 12 months. So that's a simple definition between current asset and fixed asset. So whenever you're making a purchase, make sure that you're putting it in the right place in your balance sheet. If it's inventory, you put it in current assets. If it's a piece of equipment, put it in fixed asset. So these are the type of things we have land, buildings, houses, furnishings, livestock, goodwill, those type of things. They all belong in fixed assets. So depreciation as entrepreneurs, there's two questions that you need to answer and don't let the accountant do this. So whatever you buy as an asset that has value, the first question you need to answer is what is the useful life of that asset in my business? So let's say that you buy a piece of equipment and you said that piece of equipment is going to last me 10 years. Then we take 100% divided by 10, it'll be 10% per year. That's your depreciation rate. If you leave it to the accountant, they're going to go to the CRA website and CRA says um, we can allow up to 20% for equipment. And then, you know, when I ask the accountants, why are you using these rates? Why aren't you asking this question to your, your entrepreneurs? Well, that's the way we were taught in university. Hence the fact that we're teaching the wrong stuff. So once you decide the amortization rate, and secondly, the second question that you need to answer is that will there be any residual value at the end? So if there is, meaning that you could sell it and make money still after 10 years, then we use a declining balance method of depreciation. If there's going to be no residual value at the end of that life expectancy, then we use straight line depreciation. So typically like computers and stuff like that, you use straight line because it's not going to last too long and you're not going to be able to sell it and make a whole lot of money. But if you're buying a piece of equipment or buying a vehicle or, or even a building, those type of things, they will have residual value at the end. So we use declining balance. So just to show you the difference between the two, because I see this day in, day out when I work with businesses. So let's take an example. Somebody bought a, you know, and this has happened to me in the last three or four months. People purchased a vehicle. They bought a $50,000 vehicle. And according to CRA, you can depreciate it by 30%. 
but you can either use the straight line depreciation or the declining balance. So again, accountants are saying, well, I'm going to try and save you money on taxes. So we're going to depreciate it at the maximum amount. So again, so if we take 30% as allowed for vehicles, so 30% of 50,000 is 15,000. So the book value at the end of the year is 35,000. So book value simply means that on the books, this is what it's saying that it's worth. Then we have um, the 30% of 50,000 for the second year, it's another 15,000, another 15,000. So at the end of three years, that'd be a 50,000 vehicle is worth $5,000. If you financed it over 84 months, you are technically bankrupt because on your balance sheet, it's gonna go show a value of $5,000 and it's gonna show that you still owe about $25,000 because you financed it over seven years. So. This is where people are getting in trouble. Then they're going to go to the bank and say, well, I'm running short of cash. Could I borrow money? Well, let's take a look at your financial statements. Oh, well, you know, you have a lot of debt here and you don't really have too much equity. Um, your assets are pretty well depleted. Well, no, you know, my assets are still worth something. Yeah, but on the books, that's all they show. So this is where there's a disconnect. So if we use straight line depreciation, this is what the result is going to be after three years. If we use declining balance, so the way this works is that it's 30% of the 50,000 the first year, doesn't it's, a, it's the same thing, whatever we paid for it. So 30% of 50 is 15,000. So the book value is 35,000 after the first year. But then because it's declining balance, it's 30% of the 35,000, not the 50,000. So that becomes 10,500. And then it's going to go down to 24,500 after the second year. So then it's 30% of the 24,000, which will be 7,000. So after four years, we still have something that's worth 12,000, where on the straight line method, we have zero. Now, if you financed it over seven years, then depreciate it over seven years. Never have a depreciation less than the amount of years you've actually financed it. So if you're financing a building and you got a 25 year mortgage on it, then finance, then amortize it over 25, 25 years, which is 4% per year. So this is where the difference comes. Again, coming back to book value, and this is where I'm talking about, if you need to go and borrow on the line of credit, if you need, if you need to, if you need a line of credit, they're going to look and see how many assets you have and see how much amount that they'll allow you on a line of credit. But if your assets are all depleted to zero, you got no security and no bank is going to send uh, finance you. Traditionally, uh, financial institutions, except for the community futures, of course, but traditionally, oh, the chartered banks and everybody else and the credit unions and that, they are not high risk lenders. So they're just going to look and see what physical, tangible assets do you have, and they're only going to lend you a certain amount of money on those. So on build commercial buildings, typically it's about sixty-five percent. For vehicle, for equipment, it's about fifty percent. For inventory, it's about twenty percent. For vehicles, it depends on you know if you have an insurance that they're going to you know if something happens to the to the vehicle that you're paid back, it'll, they'll typically. Um, you can get these leased or, or, or financed through GMAC and those type of things, and they'll lease the whole amount. But again, it, it, from, a, from a balance sheet perspective, it, depending on what you're depreciating it by, the value. So look at it this way the assets on your balance sheet should all be <clears throat> always be representative of what is the market value. Because if you look at your balance sheet now and you look at what the assets are, would you sell your assets for what they say that they are on the balance sheet? And in 98% of the cases, they say no. Let me give you a couple of examples. I've had two different examples. One is I had um, one business in uh, Southern New Brunswick that was had an excavating company. And he wanted to sell his company. He was getting up in age. He was about 57, 58, younger than I am. But anyway, so he wanted to sell his company. So he asked me, he says, can you, you know, can you give me an idea what this business is worth? So I said, well, send me the last five years financial statements. So he sent me the last five years financial statements. And interesting, interestingly enough is that his net profits, nothing, you know, nothing out of the ordinary because the 80% of businesses that surpass five years are making less than 1% net profit. I look at the average last five years, less than 1% net profit. I said, unfortunately, you do not have a business to sell. You're, there's only two ways to sell a business. You either sell the assets or you sell the shares. And a sole proprietorship, you cannot sell. So let's make that clear. So now it's either an asset sale or a share sale. 
you're not going to be able to sell your shares because they're not worth anything because your net profits are less than 1%. So then I said, it's going to be an asset sale. So on your books, the assets are telling me that they're worth $600,000. He says, oh, no, he says, my, my equipment's worth $1.8 million. Well, I said, let's take a look at that. Send me what the accountant has been doing as far as value of your bill, of your equipment and how he's been depreciating it. So in one particular instant, he had bought an excavator two years ago for $150,000. The accountant decided to depreciate it, that piece of equipment by, by 50% the first year. So he depreciated by 50% straight line depreciation, so $75,000, because he wanted to put it up as an expense to increase his expenses to lower his net profit so he pays less taxes. At the end of the second year, he also depreciated by the other 50%. So after two years, that $150,000 excavator is now worth zero on the books. So now he wants to sell this business. Well, I said, okay, you're not gonna be able to sell these shares you're going to retain your business. You're going to have an asset sale. So I have no doubt that you'll probably get 1.8 million for your assets, but this is what's going to happen. He says, because you still have the business, if you're selling the assets higher value than what it says on the books, because on the books, it said you only have $600,000. We're going to have what we call a gain on the sale of a capital of asset of 1.2 million because he's selling them for 1.8 million. He says they're worth 600,000. The difference between the two is 1.2. So he's gonna end up paying, cause that's gonna be considered revenue. So he's gonna end up paying taxes on that 1.2 million. Now keep in mind the first 500,000 is only gonna be at about 13%, but then it goes up quite a bit. So he's gonna end up, he's gonna end up paying about four to $500,000 in taxes on that $1.8 million in sale of equipment. So he was furious at his accountant. I said, you're not getting good advice. And I said, if I, if, I if I take your company and you didn't do all of these kind of things that you're gonna try to keep your, your net profits down, if you were to maintain your net profits at eight or 9%, so which you could, because he was just maximizing different things. I said, at 8%, with this, the business you've had, and he had it for 25 years, you'd be able to sell it for $4.5 million. But the way that it is now, you're not gonna get, you're only gonna get maybe, you know, after you pay taxes, you may get, you know, eight, 900,000. Uh, so, so, you know, what a difference. So he was a little bit very, not very happy with the whole situation. So depreciation is important. You decide, don't let the accountant decide. And whatever the depreciation amount is, let's say it's 15,000, then do a journal entry on a monthly basis. So if I take 15,000 just for this particular divided by 12, so every month I'm gonna put in my expense account, $1,250. Because if you wait till the end of the year, you still don't know if you made money or not. But if you expense things on a monthly basis and you look at your financial statements on a monthly basis, it will, um, allow you to say, am I making money or not? So you don't, there shouldn't be any surprises when you get to the end of the year. But again, you keep in mind that we need to have a, a net profit goal. And Randy said 15%, great. I, you know, we need 10% minimum or more. And so in any business. So this is where that we come back from a cash flow perspective is that if you are making profits, if you, you know, there are hundreds of ratios that exist out there. We're going to teach you a couple. But if you can do one thing and one thing right, is that after all revenues minus all expenses and even paying yourself a fair market wage, and it comes to you, Nicole. So if you look at the time that you spend in putting a piece of art together, what would be a reasonable wage that you should be paying yourself? Because that has to be added on to the cost of the, of the artwork. And that's when you sell. So this is, and I know sometimes it's what people are prepared to pay for it, but you also have to put a price on it because you've got different, you know, you've got different customers that are willing to pay for different things. I mean, we're all creatures of habits. Let, let me, let me, let me emphasize this point, first of all, is that small businesses in Canada cannot compete on price alone. If your whole strategy is just to simply to compete on price, all you're doing is you're tracking the bottom dwellers or the bargain hunters. And as soon as they find another price cheaper than yours, they're gonna drop you like a hot potato. In Canada for small business, we need to, we need to focus on quality and service. Those are the two, then we can charge the price that we want. 
And so coming back to, you know, the, a little bit what Priya alluded to earlier, when we bought a business, we went from, the business had been there for 25 years, making 200, $215,000. Last five years average was $215,000 in, in gross revenue. In the first year, we were able to go to a million and we were the most expensive store in the community. But we decided to focus on service and quality. Now, first of all, when we went in, half of the staff I had to let go. Nothing personal, but I didn't feel they had the personality in order to deal with customers. Because your front end people or your employees are the ones that are dealing with customers. I want them to have a relationship with customers because cus satisfied customers will come back. But we need to bring a customer from a satisfied level to a loyal customer. And the difference between a satisfied customer and a loyal customer is a loyal customer will refer other people to you. Now, you need a price in order to make a profit, because if you're not going to make a profit, you're going to be one of those stats that at 50%, 50%, uh, you're going to not make it to the fifth year. So a question, transactional sales versus rational uh, relational sales, uh, lowest price will not survive. Right, exactly. Sorry, but I was just a comment to no. well, and back again, up. Yep. Yeah, to back up your, your position for sure. No, and it's all about you know building relationship with customers. And and you know, and once you once you build, you know, one of the things that I had told all of my staff is that listen, I want you to have a conversation with every customer that comes in. I want you, you know, like, oh, what brought you in today? So now we're starting to get an understanding of what they're looking for. Then we'd say, oh, how did you hear about us? Well, then we'll know if our marketing's working. If we just spent $5,000 on a marketing piece and the next 100 customers, nobody mentioned that marketing piece that you just did. You just wasted $500. So it's all about having a conversation. That When we ask the customers, what do you like about our store? You keep coming here. They told us exactly what we wanted. You know, this is why we went from 200 to a million. They told us, you know, you could eat off the floor. Oh, now I know cleanliness is very important to them. So every night before the store closed, that floor was washed and buffed. So the next morning it shined. Like people would walk in and say, it's like a brand new store every day when we come in here. The produce, you know, produce is perishable stuff. I would have somebody going in there every hour and to make sure there's no blemishes or anything. I mean, if there was a cantaloupe with a little bit of a, a dent in it or whatever, so cut it in half, clean it out, put a few strawberries in it, double the price. You know, if I would have known then that I could have made money with, I, I did make money with potatoes because I would buy a 50 pound bag of potatoes and I would bag them in five pound bags. So you buy a 50 pound bag of potatoes for five bucks and then you sell a five pound bag of potatoes for two ninety nine. Well, it's not hard to do the math. If I take, I can get 10 bags of five potatoes five pound potatoes out of a 50 pound bag and the bag only cost maybe a penny or two the plastic bag so but if i would have known then that i could have taken a potato and wrapped it in aluminum foil and charged 250 for it i would have made a fortune but i ended up selling the business before that came about so anyway so understanding depreciation is important but it's simply and and from a cash flow perspective it's simply because if you're going to need to go to borrow for a line of credit or to get some money at certain points, they're gonna look at this. And that's usually where I see a big difference between what book value is and what the real value is of whatever asset that you have. The second thing that I need to mention to you is that once you've decided on the depreciation rate, and once you've decided on the depreciation method, you cannot change it for the life of that asset as long as it's in your business. So if your accountant is depreciating by 30% and you're financing it over eight years or seven years, you're already going to have difficulty on a, on, a, on a cash flow basis. So current liabilities is everything that we owe in the next 12 months. Okay. So part of this is accounts payable, credit cards, lines of credit. When people tell me, well, my accounts payable are, you know, one, one tip or trick here is that your accounts receivable should always be uh, greater than your accounts payable. But when I look at accounts payable in the business, I will, this is accounts payable. Yeah, for sure. But credit, if I own, if there's money owed on credit cards and there's a line of credit, I will take all these three as my accounts payable because I purchased something off my credit card 
and then I still owe on it, so it's an accounts payable. And I line of credit, whatever I purchase with my line of credit, I still owe it on the line of credit. So all these three, when I calculate, is this is my accounts payable. So all these three need to be lower than my accounts receivable if I'm selling on credit. If you're not selling on credit, if it's a cash business, this should be way, way low, okay? So anyway, these are the type. The other thing that I seldom see is the current portion of long-term debt on current liabilities. So that means simply is that if you have a loan, let's say you have a 10-year loan and whatever is owed in principle in the next 12 months belongs in current liabilities. And what we owe beyond 12 months is what we call long-term liabilities. So we need, so again, coming back just to have a good understanding of that balance sheet, the way it's structured, because you can look at it on a monthly basis and you can say, is my cash flow healthy? And is it going in the right direction or the wrong direction? And we'll look at uh, things that we can do in order to improve that. But this is what we're doing is that once we're once we can understand the balance sheet and it's properly structured, it's going to give you the information you need as far as cash flow, whether, whether or not we're going in the right direction or not. So these are typical things, um, again, from, uh, from the long-term liabilities. And shareholders loan with no specific repayment. So if you've lent money to the business, um, you know, one of the things that you need to, if, if, if there's no terms of agreement or repayment, it's going to be in long-term liabilities, but you know, for the most part, I see this in long-term and in, in short-term liabilities. I will see um, loan to shareholders in current liabilities. Well, this is just giving you an, an awful lot of problem, especially from a cash flow perspective, because if there's no set terms of repayment, then under current, like the definition of current liability is everything that is owed within the next 12 months. That's going to give you a cash flow problem because it's telling me, I had a, I had a person here last week that he had $54,000 in, in shareholders loan due to the company and he had it in current liabilities. He says, the bank won't lend me any money. No, because if they lend you money, they're going to think, because that needs to be paid back in the next 12 months. They say, you're going to pay yourself back the 54,000 with the bank's money. They don't like that. <laughs> so anyway, just keep that in mind. So in the equity, again, coming back is that initial investment, I'll just use an example here, common shares, whatever we used in order to start, start set up the company. The retained earnings are simply profit and losses from previous years. Now, if you're a sole proprietor, unfortunately, you do not carry over your profits. And well, you can, you're, if you have losses, you can go back seven years and claim it against your net income. Um, but your profits, you cannot carry them over from year to year. You start back at zero January 1st. And for a sole proprietor, their year end is from January 1st to December 31st. For corporations, you can decide whenever your year end and it's when, it, when it starts and when it ends. And current earnings is simply the profits and losses in the current year, year to date. Where are you now? So if you're six months into your business year, where are you now? The reason that we say that and why it's important is that if you're looking at your balance sheet and you're looking at current earnings, we just gotta make sure that in our income statement that we have allowed for those prepaid insurances and tax, property taxes and that the amortization is in there. Because if all of that's not in there, then it's not giving you the information you need to make an, an informed decision. And are you really making money or losing money at this point? So this is where people get confused. So. So far, so good. Clear as mud. A question. Uh, how do you, or what are the rules on disposal of an asset after it has been fully depreciated? Okay. So if it's zero on your balance sheet, and then you sell an asset and you make money off of it, you have to record that as a gain on the sale of a capital asset. Because in the business, it was worth zero, but then you sold it, let's say, for $2,000, then it would show up on your income statement as the, the gain on the sale of a capital asset. So because it was worth zero on the balance sheet and you sold it for $2,000, there's a $2,000 gain. And that is unfortunately going to be considered as income in your business and added on to your income as other income. Yeah, but what if it was, it was basically disposed of? And, and not, not no, so, okay. Was there still value on the balance sheet and then you disposed of it? Uh, no, if, if there was no value on the balance sheet and you disposed of it. When you say disposed of it, you threw it away or you sold it and made yeah. money on it? 
No, I take it to the junkyard. Okay, so then there's no repercussion there, Randy. It's simply it's it's it doesn't it doesn't show up on your balance sheet anymore as an asset. Yeah, so you don't have to report that somehow an asset nope. disposal. No, nope, no, nope, not at all. Okay. No. Nope. Okay. Yeah, good question. Um, so listen, it is um, ten o'clock your time. Why don't we take a just a, a five minute break? Um, you've been listening to me for an hour now. Um, your, your ears are probably ringing. So why don't you take a five minute break, uh, stand up, go for a coffee or washroom or whatever, come back at uh, five past and then we'll just keep going. Um, and then when I come back, if anybody has any questions before we can continue, we'll do that. Just a quick question, boardroom. Yes, go right ahead. Priya or Brenda, you had a question? Yes, uh, this is Priya. So I just want to know if if you have started off with, uh, uh, you know, a straight depreciation and uh, halfway through you realize you don't want to do that. Can we change? Are we allowed to change the type of... Uh, it is illegal. It is elite. You cannot change it once you've decided on that. If you're in the still a year and you haven't closed your year yet, your your final. If the year hasn't been closed off, mm -hmm. and and you only purchase that asset during that year, then you have the you can change it because you haven't filed anything with CRA yet. But if you've already filed and used a certain amount of depreciation rate and method, then you cannot change it for the life of that asset in your business. You can't go two or three years and say, oh, well, I'm going to change the rate now. You can't do that. The only way you can do that, you can do that. Sorry, you, you can do that. But mm -hmm. if you do that, you have to have a certified appraisal made and you mm -hmm. have to make a request to Revenue Canada. And then you're going to have to restate your financial statements from previous years. And it's probably going to cost you twenty dollars to $25,000 before you do all that. So you just do it right the first time. So, like, uh, is it um, is it always uh, good to go with the depleting uh, method, or is there any pros and cons for both, or is it straight away depleting depreciation is the best approach for the businesses? That's a good question, Priya. And and the thing is, is every asset is going to be different. Like I said, a computer. I would not use declining balance. I would just use straight line depreciation. But if mm -hmm. I'm looking at a piece of, you know, either a building or an equipment or a vehicle, I would always use declining balance because there will always be some residual value at the end of that term. But mm -hmm. things that are sort of smaller in nature, like even office equipment, I mean, you buy a chair, you know, the, the, traditionally what they have, you know, the rule of thumb is that you only considered an asset if it's more than $500. If it's less than $500, then you expense it. So if it's more than $500, then you can put it as an asset and depreciate it. So typically like smaller valued assets, I would use straight line depreciation. Longer mm -hmm. valued asset, I would use declining balance. But here, here's, here's a, you bring up a good point here, is that, and what I see again in a lot of businesses. So let's say you have a building, and let's say that you just put a new roof on the building. And let's say that the building roof was, let's say $80,000. Most accountants will actually use that as a repair and maintenance yeah, item in your income statement. So expensing it. Mm -hmm. If you, whatever asset that you have and you spend money on that asset, if it increases the value of that asset, we ask that you capitalize it, meaning that let's say your building was worth $200,000 and you just put an $80,000 roof on it, you probably just increase the value of that building by 80,000. So then what we do, do is we go back to the balance sheet, increase the building value to 280,000 and continue depreciating it by 4% on the new value. Don't put the 80,000 in repair and expenses because that is, again, you're depleting your balance sheet you're increasing your expenses and decreasing your net profit. That's the worst thing you can do. But if the, if the expense did not increase the value of that asset, then absolutely put it as an expense in your income statement. Yeah. Make sense? Sounds good. Yeah. And did that answer your question as well yeah. on you know, declining balance and straight line depreciation? Every asset should be different. But unfortunately, a lot of the accountants just 
put everything together and that's the wrong yeah, thing to do that's that's actually uh, the thing with accountants is they don't discuss like they have to explain us uh, if you approach depreciation in this method these will be the repercussions or like advantages or disadvantages they have to discuss about both the um, approaches uh, whereas most of them don't uh, so I think that's that's where is the communication gap between the client and the accountant well you know one accountant that I had and, and I've had some, some good ones but one of, in particular always told me operate your business as if you're going to sell it tomorrow so make your balance sheet look as healthy as possible and your income statement look as healthy. Because you never know when somebody's going to come by and buy your business. You know, on, in Canada, there's only 15% of businesses that actually transition to the second generation. 85% of all businesses end up closing. The reason they close is that nobody's interested in buying a business that's only making 1% net profit. So when when we sold our business you know we had our business for five years we you know we increased it we increased the volume the volume of sales in the first year we kept it for five years we kept increasing at the end of five years we said we came in one monday morning and we talked to the staff and said you know we've been here for five years it's time for us to move on and do other things so we're going to end up we're selling the business one of our employees that was actually doing the accounting work and was responsible as the head cashier and the produce so she would see all the numbers says, I'll buy it. She went to the bank. The bank requested the last five years financial statements. No problem in financing this business. The business was sold within 24 hours. That is unheard of. But mm -hmm. if you don't run your business as if you're going to sell it and always trying to have your cake and eat it too, you're going to get some repercussions. Make sense? Yeah, it does. Good. All right. So we'll take a, a five minute break. Okay, very good. So it's ten, uh, it's 10, uh, yeah, 10, 10, 05, 10, 06. So let's come back at uh, 10, 10 and then we'll keep on going. I'm going to stick around. So if anybody has any questions during the break, I am more than happy to, uh, to answer those questions. <clears throat> Ron, are you uh, in your presentation here at some point, are you going to go through how to value a business for sale? Not in this or? presentation. Um, I do have a power, I do have a I do have a presentation. Not in this one, but how to actually determine the value of a business. Yes. Okay. Have you, have you got some uh, basic guidelines for that, or like a close um, notes version? It's, well. I use the multiple earnings method if you're going to evaluate the, um, like I said, there's two ways of evaluating the business. Either you evaluate the shares, what the shares are worth, or you evaluate the, um, the assets. So again, coming back, you know, what, what's actually on the balance sheet may not be the true value of the assets. So you may need, you know, if it's going to be an asset sale, you certainly want to have some certified appraisal appraising what the assets are worth. If you're selling the shares, it's always going to be based on multiple earnings. So one of the things, and it's not in this presentation, Randy, but one of the things I'll always tell people is that as an investor, and, you know, I've been a venture capitalist before, and I've, you know, I've, I've been an elected official, understanding the levels of government long enough, two terms, but that was long enough. I didn't want to go back in politics, but coming back to business is that as an, you know, and sometimes we need, as owners of businesses, we need to wear our hat as an investor. If we're going to start a business or buy a business, we want to be able to look at it from an investor's perspective. So a really good business should pay for itself in three years. So somebody who's going to buy a business after we what we call normalize the financial statements is that they want to see, would I be able to repay this business in three to five years? That would be ideal. And so, but when I talk about normalization, it comes back to, you know, we got to look at the way they're depreciating things. What's the value of the assets on the balance sheet? What is, it, what is the net profit? You know, what are they? Because a lot of people, you know, sometimes I see on balance sheets, well, I see, well, there's a boat on there and there's a cottage and there's a four wheeler. And the only reason they did that is, is to be able to take advantage of the tax and not to pay the tax. Yeah. But then it just confuses the buyer when you have a whole bunch of things in there that don't belong there. So it's it's not that easy, Randy. But li listen, Randy, and I'll I'll ask Priya, Priya, if you don't mind sending out um, my email to the individuals. And Randy, if you and I, if you wanted, if we wanted to do a you know 
a quick, you know, 15, 20 minute thing, I'll, 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 uh, I'll provide you with that, that information and show you how in a very general way it's done. Um, but at least you'll have an understanding of that. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to do that. I, so you're talking like a multiple of EBITDA? Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. Yep. Three to five times, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, perfect. You know, you've got it. Okay. Um, but, but this is where we need to normalize that financial statement. We've got to clean it up a bit because sometimes, again, even I have to look at repairs and maintenance. Is, was it actually a capital? It was, should have been capitalized or not. So when we look at that, the other thing is that is the owner taking dividends or not? Because if the dividends are actually his salary, then we got to put that back into the business as far as an operating expense and or what the, the true value is. So there's a there's a few things there, but we can listen. I'd love to have a chat with you, Randy, on that. And then I can give you some guidelines because there's basically six categories in order to determine the multiplier of how you go about determining that multiplier. That's very simple. Okay, that'd be great. Okay, so I'm I'm looking at, I'm looking at, potentially, purchasing a business that I've I have ran as a GM for the last twenty one years. The same thing would apply. So whether it's a seller or a buyer, if we use the same thing, now we have a rationale for what the price should be, and not necessarily. Right. Yeah, because some people, you know as well as I do, is that. You get people who want to sell a business and they're asking this exorbitant amount of money, but then there's no rationale of how did you come up with that price? You know, like, you know, if the business can't pay for itself, it's not good to anybody. So a good investor is going to look at it from that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I've watched Dragon's Den like religiously. <laughs> <laughs> well, we used to do a lot of training for people who actually make pitches on Dragon's Den. So, you know, they need to understand net profits, gross profit, you know, all of those direct costs and that. Because when they when they say, well, I, you know, I'd like $200,000 and I'll, you know, for 20% of my company. So how, how did you come up with a million dollar valuation? You know, like. <laughs> exactly. But this is, when you listen to them, they're asking the right question because they come in their own mind. You only need to ask a couple of questions that's going to tell you exactly if that, that's a true value or not. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that I love that. I love that show. It's a very entertaining. You know, yeah. it, it's interesting though from from the Dragons Den and Sharks Tank. When they invest in a company, if they cannot get their money back in six months, they will not invest in that company. Wow, that quick. Yep. That's what, the, oh yeah, oh yeah. That's the way they operate. Well, I, I would love to be, to be able to, uh, to use that or that, that type of, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Philosophy. The philosophy to, to purchase the business that I'm running because my, my pet peeve is that I've worked my tail off for 20 some years no, granted, I've been paid my salary and, uh -huh. and whatever, but I have made them so much money over that time and built it from basically nothing to a, a, a very substantial business. Uh, when it was when when they wanted to get rid of it, uh -huh. you know, so I've, I've went against the naysayers and proved them wrong. And I get a stubborn streak in me and say, no, no, you guys don't understand what this can do. Just leave me alone. Let me show you what I can do with it. And now that I've proven it over and over again, I've all I've done is just made it way more expensive for myself to buy it. And, and the, 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 the problem is that, you know, I had no resources 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. If I didn't know then what I know now, of course, uh, I would have bought it then and I would have bought it with their money. They would have fi financed it because they didn't want it. Well, mm -hmm. and, and part of what we're talking about even this morning, Randy, is exactly that. We need, doesn't matter where you're at in business, we need to be focusing on the profitability of businesses. We need to reinvest in our business. We need to pay down debt. We got two, you know, I did the math the other day. You know, I was telling you, you know, the 80% of businesses that make less than 1% net profit, I'm not talking about the 50% that closed up in the first five years. I did the math yeah. the other day that if we were able to increase that net profit just from 1% to 4%, we would eliminate the Canadian debt in less than four years and not increase any taxes. But nobody's looking at solving that problem. This is why I'm saying we're teaching the wrong stuff in universities. I, I agree 100%. All right, we got to get back to the presentation here. Did you have a question, Jesse? 
Yeah, um, you said that if you are making money, um, <clears throat> you should be investing. Should you be investing at all times, like even if you're still in the beginning stages of your business, as long as you're putting something aside, or should you be focusing on putting everything back into your business? Well, there's a couple of things there. It's a, that's a good question, Just, just see, I, I use what we call a cost-benefit analysis. So let's say that you were able to invest money. Now, don't go to the casino or you know, gamble it off here. Uh, mm -hmm. When I talk about reinvesting, I'm talking about in the money market, something that's pretty secure. And that's the, although the interest rates are a little lower, but at least it's more guaranteed than, than, than going to, again, the casino or, or even in the uh, stock exchange. So coming back to that, there was that, let's say that you're able to get a return of, let's say four or 5% of your money, but let's say that you need to purchase something and you need to borrow money. If you can borrow money at 2%, but you can take your money and invest it at 4%, you're better off to invest your money and borrow the money to do that. But if the if the borrowing is going to be 8% and you're only making 4% on your investment, then you're better off to use your money in order to uh, pay down that, in order to reinvest in the business. Absolutely. Okay. And then when you also said, um, don't leave money in your account, are you talking about put it into investments or where do you, what well, do you mean don't leave it there? What I meant by that is the amount of depreciation. Um, so if, if we're calculating our depreciation on any type of equipment or, or assets that we have, is that if we're calculating the depreciation, the amount of that depreciation, we should take it out of our current account and put it into a separate account, that capital account, and build that up. And so okay. don't leave too much money in your operating account because the more money that's there, we have a tendency to spend that. <laughs> Right. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, good. Good questions. All right, everybody good? We'll keep on going. All right, so now how to improve cash flow and working capital. So again, when we see cash flow problems, usually the overdrafts at the limit, not, not coming down, credits are in arrears, um, salaries are stretched, no working capital, lack of profitability, we can't pay our HST. You know, one thing about HST is that it's not your money. <laughs> Let's get that straight. When you collect HST, if people are having a hard time with cash flow, I always tell them whatever the amount that you collect in HST or, or GST in your case, just take it out and put it into a separate account and build it up. So then when you owe it to the government, you'll have the money there. But if you keep it in your account, you'll end up spending it. So how to improve cash flow? Well, we're going to talk about a couple of things. Maintaining a healthy current ratio. The current ratio is simply, we talked about earlier, current assets is anything that can and will be converted into cash in the next 12 months. And current liabilities is everything we owe in the next 12 months. So that's when we're talking about the current ratio is those current assets, current liability things. We're gonna talk about inventory control. The thing is, is that if you carry too much inventory, that's just money tied up. So we need to know if that inventory is turning over or healthy. Uh, maintain a healthy interest coverage ratio. That simply is, Again, coming back to from a cash flow perspective is if you are borrowing money, how much money do you, and I'm not sure if I, I think I have it here, but how much money do you have available in order to pay the interest on loans? And normally you'd want to have at least three to four times net profits to cover the interest. If you go below that, the banks are going to become eerie. Um, selling on credit. We're going to talk about that. This is going to hit home for most of you if you do sell on credit. How to pro properly finance things. So never finance short-term assets with long-term debt <laughs> um, or vice versa. Never finance long-term assets with short-term financing. How to use a proper line of credit. We'll talk about that. And making a reasonable net profit. This is coming back to those 10% uh, or, or I should say the best in sector performers are making 10% net profit and more. The more net profits you have, the better you are. And I can tell you this right now, is that if we, if we get to the point where we're making 10% net profit, then we want to go to 11. We want to go to 12. We're always pushing the limit a little bit. But if you do get to that 10% net profit after you've taken a fair market wage, you're not going to have a cash flow problem. I can guarantee you that now. But where people are getting cash flow problems, those 80% that are just at 1% net profit. So if there's a high or low in the economy, like this pandemic, it kills them. So we need to really be focusing on getting the net profit 
in our business. And it doesn't matter what sector you're in, it doesn't matter how big you are, and it doesn't matter where you're located at geographically, you should have that 10% net profit minimum as a goal. So we'll tell you how to achieve that actually. So coming back to how to calculate the current ratio. So the current ratio is simply, again, current, I just very simple example here, current assets. So we get cash in the bank, accounts receivable and inventory. So our accounts, our current assets are $80,000. Again, the definition of a current asset is anything that can and will be converted into cash in the next 12 months. Current liabilities is everything we owe in the next 12 months. So accounts payable, short-term borrowing, accrued liabilities. Here, I know that we have a problem already because our accounts receivable are lower than our accounts payable. I said our accounts receivable should always be higher than our accounts payable. So again, coming back and looking at the balance sheet, this tells us that we're, we're gonna have a cash flow problem when that happens. But let's look at the current ratio. So simply the current ratio is current assets divided by current liabilities. So here, because we had 80,000 in current assets and 40,000 in current liabilities, basically the ratio is two to one. What this means in layman's terms is that for every dollar that I owe in the next 12 months, I've got $2 to cover it. The rule of thumb is that as soon as you go below that two to one, you're going to have a cash flow problem. So this is why we need to keep an eye on that current assets and current liabilities and make sure it's properly structured on our balance sheet, but you want a minimum of two to one. Now, and, and that is what a business with inventory. If you do not have any inventory, the minimum you want here is one to one, meaning that for every dollar of current liability, I actually have a dollar in current assets to cover it. The quick, whoops, sorry, the quick ratio, or also called the asset test here, is that the only thing we do change, like the only vulnerability is that if I need a quick cash, this is why we call it the quick ratio. If I need a quick cash, how quickly could I turn my inventory, could I turn my inventory and cash in the next 30 days? Most businesses, it's no. So from a financial institution, when they do this ratio, is they'll take current assets minus the inventory, because that's not guaranteed we'll be able to convert it into cash in the next 30 days, divided by the current liabilities. So in this case, if we go back here, our inventories were 45,000. When I take that out of the 80,000, I'm left with 35,000. So 35,000 now divided by 40,000. Now my ratio is 0.875 to one, which means that for every dollar of current liability, I still owe that money. I've only got now 87.5 cents on the dollar to cover it. If you go below $1, you're gonna have a cash flow problem. So what is the only change that we made between the current ratio and the quick ratio here? What's the only variable that changed? Can anybody tell me? Don't be shy. Anybody? What's the only variable that we changed from the current ratio to the quick ratio. We took the inventory out of the equation, correct? If we did that, when this ratio is okay and this one is not okay, that means we have too much inventory on hand. So start selling some of your inventory, convert it into cash. It means your inventory is not turning over fast enough. So again, coming back to re regulating a little bit of, you know, I, I, I know that somebody's in there, I'm not sure, who it is that has the, um, there's a couple of restaurants here. So in your inventory in restaurants should be around two to three weeks, no more than two or three weeks uh, cost of goods sold. Because if you have too much of it, it's just gonna be tied up plus it's perishable goods. But depending on the sector that you're in, I mean, women's clothing is four times a year, the turnover. If you're looking at shoes, it's three times a year. If you're looking at groceries, it's usually every two weeks. If you're looking at um, some of the wood, you know, wood, let's say it's mills and those type of things, it's normally gonna be about three times a year. So they're all different. But at the same time, you wanna keep track of, do you have sufficient inventory? You don't wanna run out as it turning over at a, at a good rate, but are my current and quick ratios okay? Again, this will tell you if you have a cash flow problem. Now correcting it is a couple of things. Coming back to what we wanna correct here, okay, are we collecting our money quick enough? But why is our payables going up? Probably the reason why these payables are higher than our receivables as we're not making enough profits. So then we got to fix the profit problem, but we'll come back to that. So coming to inventory, 
to really to, to manage your inventory is that, okay, how frequently should I be reviewing my inventory position? Well, if your inventory is fluctuating quite a bit and you're having an issue with that, the more often you do that, the better you are. I'm not saying you have to do a physical inventory count, but you should actually do one at least once a year. Even though you're using an accounting system and a perpetual inventory system in your, in your accounting, that when you receive stuff and when, because at the end of the year, there might be things that people did not actually um, expense out or there's some purchases that didn't go in. So you want to do at least a physical inventory count at the end of the year to make sure that matches what you're accounting. How much should I order? Enough so that you don't run out. But then at the same time, how quickly can that stuff come in? I've had people where they have like $20,000 pieces of equipment and you know, they, they've got three of them. Well, how many do you use? Well, usually once every three months, we, so we use one. So, okay, how long does it take you to get it in? They'll say, well, I can get one in in about a week. Why are you carrying three of these? You know, like it doesn't make sense. So, you know, so this is the type of stuff. When should I order? Again, depending on what you're using, you know, come in, let's take a look at credit cards just for a second. And I know I'm going in different tangents here, but you can make money off of a credit card because a credit card is basically, you know, you're using them as a bank. Because once you purchase from them, they basically lent you money. Because when you pay your statement at the end of the month, if you pay the full thing and you don't put anything more in your credit card, or I should say, if you pay the full amount that's due, you don't pay, you pay zero interest. So, so they actually lend you money for a period of time. If you, the three things you need to know about credit cards is your interest rate, your transition date, and your due date. So if you know what your transition date is, what I mean by that is that let's say that your transition date is on the 11th of each month. Meaning that if you purchase before the 11th, it's going to show up on that statement for that month. If you purchase on the 12th, it's going to go on the next month's statement. So now you've got 45 days to pay for it. So when you know when to order, and if you're using a credit card to purchase some of these things, order it after your transition date, then you have 45 days to pay for it. But make sure you pay for it when it comes due. Otherwise, you're they're going to charge you interest from the date of purchase. Now you're going to pay interest on 45 days as opposed to a shorter period of time. And how much should you keep on hand? Enough so that you don't run out, but enough that you keep satisfying the customers. So that's a, it's a tricky balance, but we have to keep that in mind because inventory, the more inventory you have, it's money that's tied up. It's not making you any money as long as it's sitting on the shelf. It's got to be turning over. So inventory turnover, just to give you, it basically all it is is the cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory. So how much did you, if you look at your financial statements, how much did you purchase in these materials over a year? And what's your average inventory? So how quickly is your inventory turning over? So to give you an example here, and this is a good and a bad example, and I'm using sort of like an agricultural sector type of thing. So fertilizers applied in the current year, 2019, we applied $3,369 worth of fertilizer. Our average inventory is $500. So we have six, it, our inventory turned over 6.74 times, which is basically the 500 divided by that. So the inventory supply, how much supply do I have theoretically is that if your inventory turned over 6.74 times a year, you just simply take 365 days divided by 6.74. That means that you have inventory for about 54 days. And th these are real numbers actually. And I've seen this. So the same thing, a different business, they applied basically, the, well, I use the same amounts here, but they have an average of $2,500 worth of inventory. It means that your inventory only turned over 1.35 times. So now I've got inventory for 270 days ahead. So I'm just, this is just to understand that you need to calculate your inventory turnover to see if it's reasonable. Because if you have too much inventory, like I said, it's cash that's tied up. This affects a lot of the cash flow issues and in businesses. Now, why do we, so selling on credit. If you do sell on credit, let me just tell you this. Meaning that when we sell on credit, it means that somebody comes in, they buy something, and then we just bill them, and then they pay us later. That's selling on credit. So if you do sell on credit, trust me, you will never, never never collect 100%. Why? There's some people that can't pay and there's some people that won't pay. And that's always going to be the issue. So make sure we have some good credit policies in place. 
But let me give you the realization here, okay? So let's say that, let's assume that someone owes you $2,500 and it's a doubtful account you cannot collect. So let's assume that your net profits are 1%, which is 80% of all businesses that surpass five years. And I'm not even talking about the 50% that didn't even make it to the five years because they're losing money anyway. So how much would you need to generate in sales to make up your $2,500 loss if you're only making 1% net profit? Because that loss is gonna go right to your bottom line, your net profits. How much do I need to sell? I need to sell for $250,000 in order to recoup my $2,500 loss. So let me give you an example. And this happened in our store actually. And it wasn't actually a, 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 what happened is that we had somebody come in one night. I was in there. The clerk was there the evening. It was a student. Somebody came in and they bought groceries. We had the grocery store. That was our first type of business. So anyway, so they came to the cash and they had $200 worth of groceries. So rang it in. And then they provided us with a EI check of $450. So the clerk took the check. And so, cause we did accept checks at that time. So we took the check and we gave him back $250. So then the next morning we make our deposit to the bank. And then um, that afternoon we get a visit from the RCMP. That check was stolen. It is no longer your, your check. Um, and you have lost $450. All right, so now if I'm only making 1% net profit at four at four hundred and fifty dollars, we need to sell. We need to generate forty five thousand dollars worth of sales just to recoup that four hundred and fifty dollars because I've lost it. And if I'm only making one percent net profit, although I wasn't making one percent, it was a little bit easier. But it's just to make people understand. So, you know, a lot of times what I see is when I have employees that are working at the front. And actually, this happened to me last week. I wanted to order a tempered glass. 16 inch by 53 inch tempered glass with rounded edges. So the guy took my name and number and I said, so I ordered it. So um, I said, would you like to be, would you like me to pay for it now? Or, you know, or when I pick it up? Well, he says, it's your choice. Wrong answer. He should have said, I want you to pay for it now. Because this is where, again, people get in trouble. Whenever somebody's buying, just ask, how would you like to pay for that? Don't offer them to put it on credit, because if you offer it, they'll always take it. So then you don't have the cash to work with. From a cash flow perspective, it's very important, especially when you have people that are ordering. This is, a, this is an off thing, like it's 16 by 53 inch uh, tapered glass glass. If I didn't go and buy it, when I, I'm going to go and get it, it's 325 bucks. But if I didn't go and, buy, and get, it, get it when he actually brings it in, because you know, there's no commitment there. Um, he's gonna, what is he gonna do with this class now? Now he's gonna have to try and sell it and get whatever he can for it. A lot of businesses, this is what happens. So whenever, if ever people are ordering stuff from you, get the money up front. And then when it comes in, this is a new trend that's going on. You cannot give credit out because you will never collect 100%. This is one of the things that you need to understand. So coming back to credit, if you are selling on credit, Make sure you have proper credit policies, terms and conditions. Make sure that the people have signed so that they are committed to pay. Customer qualification criteria. You don't, you don't want to be their, whole, their sole supplier here. Um, make those credit checks, you know, reference checks and that. Um, and then simply just have a good credit policy if you're going to sell on credit. And the reason we say that is because when we look at accounts receivable turnover, is that when we're doing this, you know, some people say I have a credit, I have a 30 day credit policy. Well, we have to divide our average accounts receivable by our, by our credit sales. So let's take an example here. So let's assume that our sales are $500,000 and our average account receivable is $40,000. The actual receivable, the, the account receivable turnover is 40,000 divided by our revenue. So it would be 12.5 times. So if I take 12.5 times divided by 365, that means that people are paying me on an average every 29.2 days. If I have a 30 day credit policy, it's great. It's working great. But if only I have 60% of my sales are credit sales and the other 40% are cash sales, which means people are paying with their credit card or cash or whatever when they actually purchase it. So I've only got 60% credit sales. Now it's 300,000 as opposed to 500,000. 
then what is my accounts receivable turnover? It's still 40,000 divided by the 300,000, it's 7.5 times. So if I take my 365 divided by my 7.5 times turnover, it's equal to 48.7 days. So if I have a 30 day credit policy and people are paying me on average 48 days, you're gonna have a cash flow problem because your suppliers probably wanna get paid in 30 days. So now you're gonna have, so now you gotta finance these people. Whenever you're giving credit, you are actually a bank to these people. So let me give you one, one, one little tip here before I go to the, the, the chat here, is that I was working with a company in Saskatchewan not that long ago, and they're working, they're, they're providing some services to the oil sector. And there's two or three of these big conglomerates that, you know, they'll buy on credit and they'll take their dear old time to pay, sometimes 90, 120 days. So the client that I had, I said, this is what we only on the slow play, playing clients, because they're just using you. Because now you've got to go and borrow money from your line of credit in order to pay your operations. So now there's an added cost to that. Plus, you've got to pay interest on your line of credit because people aren't paying you in time. And if you do put 2% two, two interest rate, they'll never pay the interest rate. They'll always waive that, but they'll take their dear old time to pay you back. So what we did with this one client, I said, this is what we're going to do. We increased the price, the invoice, by 10%. And then we put on the invoice, if you pay within 10 days, we will give you a 10% discount. That caught their eye. Now they want the 10% discount. If you give them a 2% discount, that's not enough to entice them. But if you give them a 10% discount, they're going to really look at it. So now they're paying within 10 days. If they don't pay, he's already increased the price by 10%, more than enough to pay his line of credit for the next 90 or 120 days. So that's what, they, that's what we were doing with them. All right, so there's a... Okay, so um, I sold eight drawings to someone. Um, they paid for half. I still didn't receive the other half, but they have all the work. I did. Lesson learned. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Yeah, it is. It's a hard. It's the same thing. I was working with some picture frame stores, and then you know, because people come in into the picture frame store and they say, "Well, they've got this picture. It's an odd size, so they ordered the picture frame, and so they give the dimensions." So some of these stores that I was working with, what they would do is they would not take a deposit or they wouldn't even take the money up front. So then people would order, the, um, they, they would order their picture frame. And then all of a sudden, well, they decided not to come and get their picture frame. So now you, you've heard, as the owners, they have, you know, if you walk into some of these picture frame stores, right at the door, you got a whole bunch of picture frames and they're on sale dirt cheap. Why? Because they're not sized. Nobody has that size and they're just trying to get rid of them because they somebody came in and ordered that size. They didn't come and pick it up and now they can't sell it. So whenever you're any, anything that you're doing customized and especially Nicole, what you said, get the money up front before you even start. And that way there. And if people don't want to pay that, then probably not the customer you want to be doing business with. So Jesse, I no longer order my group orders until I have full payment up front. I used to do a deposit and now I skip that step and cut to the chase. Good for you, Jesse. Walmart doesn't take deposits. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> so there's some, there's some that do and some that don't. So again, the, again, take advantage of those. Um, again, from a business, from an owner's perspective, you can take advantage of that. If your customer, if your supplier is not, is, doesn't need to take the money. But at the same time is that if you as a business, I think it, um, um, it's up to you to do your due diligence. Yeah, you get nervous to ask up front. But again, you know, I would just say, you know, how do you want to pay for that? It's like electricians and plumbers and carpenters and all that. I usually say, you know, before you leave the door, let's say you're an electrician and you want to do a job at a house. Before you leave the door, make sure that you put the, you have the invoice ready for you and just say, how would you like to pay for that? You know, get a square or get, you know, this emailed. Uh, e-transfer or direct deposit, like there's all kinds of ways now that you can do that. So make sure that you ask for the money before you leave. Because whenever you're selling on credit, there is an absorbent amount of time used in administration to administer these credit, these credit customers. You have to put the invoice together. You have to send it out. You have to check, make sure that they pay. And if they don't have pay, you have to give them a call. Like the time that is used up in order to give credit out. So one of the things that I actually tell people is that if you're gonna give credit, make sure that is realized in your strategy 
of your pricing strategy. Increase your price by two or 3% in order to cover that cost because it is a real cost to a business. Good for you, Nicole, good for you. Okay, so just so that you know, so when people can't pay or won't pay, and then you go to a collection agency, just keep in mind how they work. So here it's based on size, here it's based on age. So based on size, under $100,000, they will usually require 50%. So you've already lost 50% if you go that route. The other thing is that, let's use, let's use an example. Let's say that somebody owes you a thousand bucks and that they charge 50%, the collection agency, and they can only collect $600. Well, guess what? <clears throat> if they can only collect six hundred dollars, they're going to keep five hundred, and they're only going to give you a hundred dollars because the fifty percent is off the top. So keep that in mind. So again, I just wanted you to have an understanding of what collection agencies do. I'm right, just keeping track of the time here. Hold on. Okay, we got to. So how to properly finance equipment? The pro and there's pros and cons of financing and pros and cons of leasing. So the pros of financing is foreseeable monthly payments, financing equipment builds credit on the business, and eventually the ownership of the, of the equipment, uh, you only actually own the equipment down the road. Equipment is good collateral. Many lenders require less documentation since the equipment is collateral. And there's a potential for tax benefits because you can claim the interest on the loan as an expense, and you can also claim the depreciation on the loan, and it does build equity. So that's the pros of financing. The cons of financing, however, the equipment becomes outdated sometimes before it's paid off. Um, possible unfavorable loan terms if less than perfect credit, because they will, you know, <clears throat> it's again, it's interesting. You know, you go to vehicles and, and you say, okay, they say <laughs> there's a manufactured, there's a suggested manufacturer's price. So, and there's a price on the window, but then, you know, if you finance it, it's gonna be based on that. But then if you pay cash for it, it's gonna be a lot less than that because the interest is calculated in the price. When they say there's no interest, believe me, nobody gets a free lunch and nobody gives a free lunch. The interest is included in the price. So make sure you are, or you, you, you um, negotiate that when you're doing that. Um, <clears throat> down payments can be high and responsible for all maintenance costs and you must pay for repairs. If we look at leasing, usually no money down, no collateral required in many instances, option to either renew and, uh, or end the lease contract when it expires. Now, some people, what they're doing, and I found that, you know, <laughs> people do different things, but what they've been doing is that if they lease, let's say they lease a vehicle and they lease it through the company, they will have the lease very high in order to, so that the residual value at the end of the lease is gonna be very little. And then they personally buy that from at the residual value at the end for a very small price. So they're using the company expense in order to depreciate that vehicle as quickly as possible. Then they go and buy that at the end of the lease for a very small amount. So they'll say, okay, put my lease up at $1,500 a month. Uh, for one year, and at the end of one year, then I can buy the vehicle for twenty thousand dollars, and it's only a one-year vehicle. So some people are using that in order to get around it. Anyway, can trade equipment for newer model at the end of the lease, and choice of purchasing the equipment at fair market value when lease ends. So this is where, again, either fair market value or if you increase your lease, you can put it; it'll be lower than market value. Um, the cons though, it delays or no ownership of the machinery. It's more expensive than financing in the long run. You must commit to keeping the equipment at the end of the lease agreement. There's few potential for tax breaks. The choice of equipment is more limited and you still need to pay the repairs on the wear and tear of that, of, of that leased equipment. So there's good and bad. So the thing is, is that you just gotta keep in mind and again, coming back to financing or, or leasing or financing is that never, you know, if you have a line of credit, don't go and buy a piece of asset. The reason being, let me go back to, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going back here, but I'm going to go back to this. So let's say hypothetically now we have a line of credit. I don't have it in here, but let's say we have a line of credit of $25,000 and we have a piece of equipment that just broke down and it's $10,000. 
well, I'm not going to go and finance that. I'm going to use my line of credit. So all of a sudden, your line of credit was 25000 Now it's lower. So now we've only got 10000 left because we use, let's say, $15,000 to buy this piece of equipment. If we buy them, so our, our current liabilities just went up by $15,000 because we used the line of credit. But our assets, current assets didn't change because we bought the piece of equipment. It goes into long-term asset you're gonna get a cash flow problem simply because now if you don't look at the ratio, now we've got, 20, let's say $15,000 more in current liabilities, we're up to 55,000 that we owe in current liabilities. If we just use 15,000 from a line of credit, our current assets never change. So now the banks are gonna be, this is where the red flags come in and this is when they start calling loans. So if you don't manage your things properly, you're gonna get into trouble. So when using a line of credit, so the line of credit is really a revolving loan and it allows you to access to a fixed amount of money, you know, at a given time. But the line of credit should be used for stuff that is short term, purchasing inventory, repairing a, a, repairing a piece of equipment or bridging seasonal cash flow gaps. So, you know, some months are going to be high, some months are going to be low. So you want to be able to have some cash in order to carry you through. So that's what we use it for. So just make sure you're using it for the right thing and don't use the line of credit again to actually, to actually purchase long-term assets. So periodically pay down the balance in order to, you know, to let the people know that you're using this properly. If you're always at the limit all the time, then there's a problem. Um, using a, a line of credit to cover operating losses is not the best thing. That's going to kill you in the long run. Now you owe too much debt. This is again where banks call the loans. Think strategically about your capital needs. So if you want to go for a line of credit, go when you're at your top, at your peak in your business, because that's when it's going to look good. If you go when you actually need it, it's going to look bad and you're probably not going to get what you need. So, so why do we need profits coming back to, I'm trying, listen, I, I, am, I know I'm trying to give you as much information in a short period of time. There's so much stuff I want to share from you, but I'm glad that you're still hopefully awake and, 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 and getting all this stuff in. So coming, this is where I, I want to get to profits and, and we'll, we'll sort of, this is sort of the last sort of part of this is that we need profits and this comes back to the 10%. If we do have 10%, we're not going to have any cash flow problems. But most businesses are not at 10%, so we need to get to the 10%. So I'm going to show you how to do that. But why do we need profits? So contingency funds. So those ups and downs in the economy, pandemics that we just have, we can hire more staff. The, the more you spend on intellectual property, by that I mean by staff that can actually make you money, the better off you are. It's a little bit like Randy. I mean, the company invested in Randy. Randy's making them some money. So the, thing, the same thing, if you hire staff, the better staff that you have, the more that you're going to be able to make money. If, if people tell me that I have a hard time finding qualified people, the problem is probably you're not paying enough. But if you're going to pay more for people, you're going to attract better people. But if you're going to pay more, you also want to return on investment. So you need to hire people that are actually going to make you money. So you need to set, the, set objectives. You need to set goals. You need to have those performance evaluations so that are they meeting those goals? Do they have all the tools and things that they need in order to achieve, to do their job well. So this is where it comes back to some of the HR stuff. But again, investing in people, you know, we can, we can buy equipment, we can replace equipment, those type of things, but the most bang for your buck on return on investment is gonna be the people. Now, if you don't have employees like Nicole, you're, you're, you're your own artist, so that's fine. But I'm just saying that if you do have employees um, and, and you have profits, this is where things can really improve. Um, you want to attract new customers. People like to do business with businesses that are successful. Um, you need to buy new equipment in order to become more efficient. You want to pay down debt. That's why we have profits. It's going to come from profits. Increase personal income and increase the value of the business. If you're only making 1%, there's no value in the business. But if you're making 10%, Again, when you look at, we all have options to invest money. We could go to the bank and the bank's going to give us maybe 1% or 1.5%. We could 
buy T bills and or, or treasury bills and, and guaranteed income certificates, GIC. There you're lending your money to the federal government and they'll give you maybe one and a half percent or two percent. Then you can go to mutual funds. Well, that's going to be three to five percent. You can go to blue chip companies. Well, that's going to be seven to ten percent. So but if you're making 10% in your business, that's better than what you can get in most of the um, places where you, you, you can invest right now. So this is why you wanna focus on your own business. Think like an investor in your own business. So coming to sort of where we make money is between the revenues minus all expenses and what's left, that's our profit. So when we look at it from a, from a chart of accounts perspective, this is at the 30,000 foot level. Our, our chart of accounts should be structured this way, like revenues, cost of goods, like direct materials, direct labor. So if you're bringing in stuff from the outside, shipping cost goes in there. If you have shop supplies, that goes in there. If there's exchange on the dollar, that goes in there. A lot of times I don't see that in the cost of goods. They're down in the operating expenses. Cost of goods is any cost you incurred in order to make the sale. So it's billable hours and it's material that you charge the customer and everything else that came along. So if you're buying materials and you're paying for shipping, that shipping becomes part of the cost of the materials. You have to add that in. Most people are, are not getting that. The gross profit is simply the revenues minus the cost of goods. What's the amount of money that I have left in my business in order to pay all my other operating expenses and to make myself a net profit? So I start with the end in mind, which is a lot different than most people. So I start, what do I want to finish with? What, what, what kind of net profit do I want? And again, I don't focus totally on the dollars because I can sell twice as much, but that doesn't mean I'm going to make twice as much money. So I focus on the bottom. I start from the bottom up approach. I start with, I want, I want to have 10% net profit at the end of the day. After I pay all my expenses, both costs of goods and operating expenses, I want 10% in my pocket. And that is after I have paid myself a fair market salary. So the way to get the 10%, there's only four things you can do and only four. So let's not complicate it more than we have to. So the four things we can do is we can decrease the cost of goods sold as a percentage of sales. The second thing we can do is decrease the operating expenses as a percentage of sales. We could increase the price and increase the sales volume. So this is where I come back. Take care of the pennies. The dollars will take care of themselves. So let me give you this example. I had this guy that was making garden sheds. Okay. So he was at 1% net profit and he wanted to get to the 10%. So I said, okay, what are you selling your garden sheds at? Well, he says for a 12 by 16 with a door and a couple of windows, I'm selling my garden shed at $2,900. I said, okay, how many are you selling? He says, I'm selling 800 of me a year. I said, how come you're selling so many? He says, nobody can compete with me on price. And this is the guy that didn't want to increase the price, but he also wanted to get from one to 10%. So I said, do me a favor. Nicole, can you mute your, your mics, please? Oh, sorry. No problem. So so I asked, I asked the guy, I said, um, okay, this is what I'd like you to do. For the next two months, instead of charging 2,900 bucks for a 12 by 16 shed, can you charge $2,958? That's all, just bring it up by $58. Take care of the pennies, the dolls will take care of themselves. So he said, all right. So after two months, I went back and says, how many people actually complain about the price increase? He said, not one person said anything. I said, look at it this way. That $58 on $2,900 is a 2% price increase. I said that $58 times 800 sheds is about $47,000 more in your pocket. At the end of the year, that 2% price increase, you went from 1% net profit because everything else stayed the same as expenses. That 2% price increase went to your bottom line. So now you are at 3% net profit. You have just tripled your net profit. And listen, the cost of living goes up by one and a half to two percent every year. So if you not if you are not increasing your price by one and a half to two percent every year, you are going backwards. If you haven't had a price increase in in five years, you are ten percent behind. So you need to keep up with that. So the first thing we could increase the price. That's one thing. So the second thing I said to him, I said, okay, you're making eight hundred sheds. There must be you're you're buying a whole lot of supplies from somebody. He says yeah. He says I got a couple suppliers, and they they treat me well. So I said I want you to call them up. And I said, 
uh, listen, you've been with them for a long while. So ask them if you could get a 1% discount on the purchases of your materials. Don't ask for three or 5%, you'll never get it. Just ask for one. So he called up the supplier and he says, you know, not very many people call me and ask for that. But he says, listen, I don't want to lose you as a customer. Well, the customer said, I don't want to lose you as a supplier either. He says, I'll give you 1% um, discount. But I'll tell you what, I said, if you pay me within 10 days, I'll give you an extra 2%. So now he's paying every before 10 days. So he saved 1% on his product and he saved 2% on his um, on paying by within 10 days. So now he's got three more percentage points, think in percentages, the take care of the pennies, the dolls will take care of themselves. So now he was at he was at 1%. He increased his price by 2%. So he went to 3% net profit. He just saved 3% on his materials. He is now at 6% net profit. So then I asked him, I said, okay, who's building these? Well, he says, I got two guys and they're working 44 hours each a week and they're building these sheds. I said, do you think that you could let them go one hour early at the end of the week? So instead of paying for 44 hours, we're paying for 43. Well, he says, well, he says, uh, let me go ask them. So he went to ask them, they were delighted to go home one hour at the end of the week. And you see, um, they, they take smoke breaks and this and this. It's, it's really not going to affect any production if they go uh, an hour early at the end of the week. So I so said, one hour out of 44 is equal to 2.15% that you're going to save on labor. He was at 6%. He is now at 8.15%. And the thing is, is that with that, is that we, we needed to set up some goals as a percentage of revenue. So we once he did the materials, wherever he was, we reduced it by 3% because he saved 2% by paying 10 days and 1% on. So he reduced his cost of materials by 3% from what he was before. So coming back to sort of a benchmark. Then we also looked at the, um, the wages and the same there. He saved 2%, 2.15% on wages. So we need to monitor that on a month-to-month -month basis as a percentage of revenue, what his costs are to make sure we're in line with those percentages. The last thing I said, okay, the third thing we can do is that, can you reduce your indirect operating expenses? So that is, you know, the heat, the lights, the telephones and all that. Well, he says, I'm not, I said, just try to find me 1%. That's all I'm asking, 1%. Well, you know, within that, you have a lot of things you have control over. So donations, advertising, office supplies, meals, travels, there's a whole bunch of things. So I said, just find me 1% out of your all your operating expenses, but we need to monitor that on a month-to-month -month basis in order to make sure that we, we maintain it at 1% lower than what we were before. So now he saved 1% there. So now he has that, he's at 9.15%. The other thing we can do is we can increase the sales. If we increase the sales, the cost of goods, materials and labor will be proportional. If we sell twice as much, it's gonna cost us twice as much in labor, twice as much in materials. So proportionally, it doesn't change. However, your indirect expenses, your telephone's not gonna be double. If you double your sales, your telephone's not gonna be double, your heat's not gonna be double, your lights, your taxes, all of that stuff. So as a percentage of revenue, your operating expenses will be lower. So what you do is you have to benchmark your operation where were you to start with? And then we say, okay, we're gonna reduce our uh, cost of goods sold by 2%. So now we're gonna set the goal at 51. And if you take your income statement on a monthly basis and you look at your revenues, what were my costs divided by re my revenues? Am I at 51.7? If I go up to 52 or 53, my problem is in this area, that's where I need to go fix it. If I, and you know, we have labor and everything in here and here, I, I, I've got it almost, uh, categorize in a group but we can divide that the operating expense so that would be the first thing so we went from four percent to six percent if we two percent reduction in indirect expenses so we were at 42.3 we're going to try to operate at 40.3 again if you have budgets you should put budgets in place but set some goals as a percentage of revenue so let me give you an example, donations. And I know I'm getting almost to the time limit here, but let's take a look at donations. I would always put every budget item as a percentage of revenue. So let's say my donations is going to be 0.05% of my revenues. And let's say it's a thousand bucks that I'm going to budget for donations. If my revenues go up, 
I'm going to spend a little bit more than my thousand bucks, but no more than my 0.05% of revenues. But if my revenues go down, I'm going to spend less, but no more than 0.05%. So if you maintain your percentages, you'll be okay. That's why I say the numbers go up and down all the time, convert to thinking in percentages. Unfortunately, there is no accounting software that will convert what you need in percentages all the time. So here increasing the price. So I just, I'm, I'm sort of getting get going quickly here because we only get a couple slides left. But benchmark current performance, the six step process to get your 10%. Benchmark where you are now, set some goals, reduce direct and indirect operating cost as a percentage of revenue. Look for opportunities to increase revenues, including the pricing. And then if you cannot measure it, you can't manage it. So we need to measure. Um, the only, I've got a couple more here. Uh, I'm gonna have to stop it there because we're at the time, but you've got these two slides and this is how you set your price. If you come back and you do it as a percentage, just, just keep in mind. So I will start with the bottom. I want 10% net profit. My indirect costs, if I've been in business for a while, I know what these are as a percentage of revenue. So from a bottom up approach, if I know what my indirect cost is a percentage of revenue and I want 10% net profit, I add these two together, I need a 35% gross profit in order to pay all my indirect expenses and make a net profit. So if I need a gross profit of 35%, because these two, gross profit, your gross profit is simply the revenues minus direct expenses. So gross profit plus direct expenses is always equal to 100%. So that means my cost cannot be more than 65% of my revenue. So what you can do is doesn't matter if you're in a service sector, if you're making paintings, Nicole, if you're whatever you're doing, if you want to know what your price should be, you simply take a look at what is my direct cost for either a product or unit or service or whatever that may be. If I want 10% net profit, I will take that cost that I've estimated. I'm going to divide it by 0.65 because it my price is going to be 65% of my revenues. This is what I need to sell it at. But some people will nickel and dime. You say, well, you know, can you do a little bit, a bit better on the price than that? So I always set myself a lower limit, but never below 5%. So then if my net profit is 5%, if my net profit here is 5%, my indirect expenses are still going to be 25. Then I need a gross profit of 30%, which I can allow my direct expenses to be 70%. This is where that 70% comes in. Then my price would be $3,121. So... Don't be afraid to ask for help. You've got the community of futures out there that are helping small businesses. Please get them to, you know, to help you. But the, she, they are bringing people like us in in order to help businesses. And we're also to provide some workshops like this. So I'm going to stop sharing for the time being. I know I've covered a lot of information in a very short time. Um, and, uh, and I just wanted to um, thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, I'd be more, I'll stay on for a while here. So if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer that. And at the same time, did it provide you any sort of information in order to help you out in your businesses? Hi, Ron. Yes, I found the depreciation uh, term most interesting uh, on a personal level from the years we farmed. I know we probably depreciated it out over the shorter term so that we would receive the bigger income tax return annually. So that is the strongest information that I gathered today, but a lot of great information and I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marion, for your comments. Much appreciated. I'm an entrepreneur like you, and I'm just trying to help, you know, things I've learned over my career, I'm just trying to share it with, uh, with other entrepreneurs. So, you know, we're all in this together. That's for sure. Lots of knowledge and much appreciated. You're quite welcome. And you have a comment from Jesse. Yeah. So, uh, Jesse, have you been in some of my workshops before? Um, yeah, I came and saw you once when you were in Yorkton. I don't know where you're where you're located now. I'm in Nova Scotia. You are okay because I remember your story about um, opening the grocery store at night. 
Um, and I've gone back to many of your stories over time, and I keep telling my mom that we need to listen to your presentation. So thank you so much. You're quite welcome. What she's alluding to is that in order to grow our sales, um, we, we're in a small fishing village. So, you know, people come in and they want to get some groceries. So fishermen come in at two or three o'clock in the morning. All they want is ice and food and go back out for another 10, 12 days. That's how they make money. Nobody would open their stores before eight or nine o'clock in the morning. So one night I just went down to the wharf and uh, as soon as the first fishing boat came in around one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, this is my business card. If ever you need groceries, just call me anytime, night or day, and I will go open up the store. But there's a couple of things. I can't sell it to you at sale price. It's going to have to be full price and I'm going to need cash up front or else, you know, a, a, a check or, and they said, no problem. The next day I started getting orders and then after it just ballooned from there. So people were coming in. So, I mean, we took away over $800,000 worth of, in a small fishing village of 900 people, we took that away from our competitors. They weren't very happy, but they weren't doing what they needed to do. So, so you know, thank you, Jesse, for reminding me that. That's good. Yeah, for sure. I learned a lot from it. And since then, um, I, I'll meet people at the store before they go for their shift to the hospital if they need a new set of scrubs. So. I have some early mornings and late nights, but it's definitely worth it. <laughs> awesome. Very good. Excellent. Glad. I'm glad you're able to use some of that. Anybody else? You're quite welcome. Just another comment there. It is my pleasure. Again, it's always my pleasure. Thank you, Priya, for actually, you know, for Yorkton to reach out. And, you know, we've been, we worked on this, I think it was back in the summertime or even early, early summer that we were looking at providing something. And so it materialized and here we are, but sometimes it takes a little while. So, and again, it's my pleasure. And thank you again, Priya, for you and, and your team in order to bring me in. I always appreciate that. Yeah, it was it was really a great session. Like it, for any session, until unless people interact, uh, it, it, it doesn't become interesting. Uh, it, it's because of the interesting content of yours, which kept them engaged throughout the session. That was the hit point for this uh, presentation. Um, now we have realized uh, how important uh, this subject is for all the business owners or employees, you know, working with them. So yeah, we look forward to, uh, you know, get collaborate with you even more and uh, bring people together. Like I will share your information, contact information with all the participants yeah. so that if they have any queries or if they have any concerns, they can reach out to you or they can drop us an email and we can forward that information to you so that, you know, we can bridge the gap between you and the clients. Absolutely. So yeah, we're very happy to accommodate uh, all the participants today and we are glad that they thoroughly enjoyed this session. Thank you, Priya. I think Randy's got a question. Yeah. No, I was just gonna... your truck. <laughs> no, I'm in my office now. I was just going to thank you for, uh, uh, for the presentation that was very good, very interesting. Is, is I put a comment in, but I think it, it didn't get seen. It was, was it, were you able... Uh, or is this uh, a copy of this presentation available online or somewhere? Or um, Priya has it on the PDF, and I think she's going to distribute it to everybody. If if you don't already have it, you will get one, or Priya can send it to you. So yeah. Okay. Yep. Great. Awesome. Yeah. And your your contact information is there, Ron. Priya will will, will disseminate it. Okay. So, fantastic. Thank you so much. My pleasure. All right, I think um, if there's no other questions, again, thank you again. And um, Priya, you know how to reach me and then we'll send out that information. And um, I might send you, I might send you, it's a performance scorecard that I have. It's just mm -hmm. an Excel spreadsheet, but you just take the numbers from your income statement and you plug it in and it calculates your percentages. I mean, if there was more category, it's just a template. So it's got revenue one, two, three, up to six. So if you have six different type of revenues, if in your business you had more than that, you can ex ex uh, you can expand it, but the same thing, the direct costs, and then so it's sort of a, a little spreadsheet that can be used in order to um, monitor your operation and make sure you have some goals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll send that to you right away. 
I can uh, circulate it to all our participants today so that they can use it in their day-to-day -day business. Okay, very good. Brenda, okay. are you still awake back there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's different through Zoom, but listen, it's the next best thing to being there. So again, we're in this time of uh, pandemic and that, we're doing the best that we can, but still getting the message out. So it's really good kudos to you guys. So thank you once again, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Ron, for taking time and giving us this wonderful platform to interact with you and get our queries answered. So I'll not keep anyone waiting. Thank you so much. I will drop you guys the contact information and Ron and any material uh, related to the session. You can get back to us with your feedback or or suggestions, or if you need anything uh, in addition to what we have provided today, we are very happy to accommodate your needs. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day. Okay, bye for now. Bye-bye.